struggles because the moment you laugh, it just seems to dissipate any kind of pain. And I like to say laughter drains the main pain. So without further ado, Whoa. yeah, without further ado, I would love to introduce my incredible guest, the one and only Stephen Sarge Pickman. He is a celebrity. Oh. Yes, he's a celebrated comedian. He is a sought after motis- motivational speaker. And he's also the author of a really terrific read cause, called I'm still well, it's, standing it's up. actually, let me, let me correct you. It's actually called Black Boy Chick. I'm still standing up was apparently offensive to handicapped people. So they made me change the title after I went to publisher, the whole thing, I had to change it to something more ethnic. And now it's called Black Boy Chick. And to this day, I've sold 37,213 copies of Black Boy Chick. And I am surprised beyond all else that I'm even available for Flip the Switch because I am so busy during these, you know, very challenging times. So I'm just glad that I could be here for this and for the 20 minutes of technical malfeasance that preceded this. Malfeasance, that's such a good, good word. I, listen, I, 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 this is a big deal for me to be handling everything and doing all of the tech stuff. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, what is it? The, the, uh, the turtle wins the race. So uh, this is a big deal for me to be undertaking, and you know, technical difficulties and all this stuff. But anyway, enough about that. And thanks for pointing it out, Sarge, because I love when you point out stuff like that. I just want to tell everybody that uh, Sarge has been a constant, except there was a, what, seven, eight year span that we really, <laughs> we didn't talk. But I have to say, he and I, uh, I always, there was like three of us, we piled around. It was Sam Brown, Sarge, and me. And it was really some of the best times I had in my stand-up career, because it's when we first started. We were also in the first Toyota Comedy Festival together, which was pretty amazing. You know, we all camped out in front of, um, not Sarge's Deli, what was the deli? Carnegie, Carnegie Deli. Carnegie Deli. Anyway, I, Sarge has been, just, uh, you know, an influence. He is brilliantly funny. Uh, I would love to just take a step back in time and talk about what it was like for you. Like, uh, when did you follow your calling of being a stand-up comedian? So why don't you tell your story? Well, you know, um, thank you very much. And um, yes, the, the Toyota Comedy Festival. And yes, um, being seen at six in the morning by Alan King while he was having a cigar, a prune Danish and a seltzer. Is there anything more classically Friars Club, Catskill Mountain than Alan King judging? And, and people were lined up out the back loading door of the deli, around the corner, down four blocks. I mean, there was a steady line. I went directly from doing uh, sets at the comedy clubs two waiting online at 2.30 in the morning to make sure I was one of the first ones there at 6 a.m. Yeah, but we were all there. We 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 were third and fourth. We were third and fourth. That was amazing. A guy with a chair. There was a guy that had an act that he did with his chair. And there was somebody in the front. I went in third. And um, there's a funny backstory to this. You know, my grandfather and Alan King played gin together. Alan King, for those of you who are um, under 80, um, was a legendary comic, uh, a legend. I mean, you know, before there was Pryor, before there was, uh, uh, before there was uh, Robert Klein, any of these people, Alan King was the dean of all comics. And, um, and so Is him and my they, grandfather- They called him that, the dean, right? He was, well, he was the dean of the Friars Club. And so he was the dean. He was the king of comics, Alan King. So um, anyway, he was gin rummy partners with my grandfather at the Friars Club and at the Beach Club out in Long Island. So. When I realized he was seeing comics for this, I had one really, really mediocre tape of myself from New Talent Showcase Night at Caroline's that Andy Angle ran. And I, consequently, I think he's still running it, but only at Gotham now. He's at Gotham now. Is, it's at Gotham now. So anyhow, I had this lousy tape and I put it in a package and I put a note together. And I originally, you know, I grew up in Great Neck and Alan King had the most uh, amazing house in Great Neck. He lived in Kings Point. Uh, obviously, Alan King, King's Point, the whole thing. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to put my tape. I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to tell him who I am. I'm Herman Shane's grandson. 
and that he should know I'm coming to Carnegie Deli to audition for him. So I went to his house and uh, I had this tape and a letter and, and, and telling him who I am, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I knock on the door, this big door knocker, boom, boom, boom. And this woman comes in a maid's outfit, um, dressed like Shirley Booth, but definitely not Shirley Booth. <laughs> also, another reference you have to know if you're, if you're under 80, Shirley Booth was Hazel, who was yes. a famous TV sitcom maid. So I knock on the door and this woman comes over and she said, Mr. K no home, he no home. So I said, well, no, no, I just want to leave this for him. She said, you, you can leave this for him, he no home. I said, well, just leave it here. So when he comes here, he'll see this because I'm Herman Chain's grandson. Okay, okay, thank you. She takes the envelope and slams the door. Cut to loading door of the Carnegie Deli. I'm third, I go in and I start my amazing, my amazing act at the time. I, I'm black and Jewish and the Jewish part of me doesn't work on Shabbos. Black part tries not to work the other six days. I sit in the back of a bus <laughs> that, I, that, I, that I own. I own the bus, <laughs> but I sit in the back. I'm black and Jewish. I don't know whether to say yo or oi. I'm a black Jew. I hire myself to clean my own house. Well, anyway, Alan King is sitting there. He's laughing and he's waving his cigar. And he goes, all right, all right, all right. You got it. You got it. Stop. It's good. You're funny. You're good. And he points with the cigar. Come here. He says, do you have people? I said, where? People where? Like people, people that handle. I said, I kind of have people to handle. Good. He says, uh, give me their number. I'm going to call them. So I had a manager that was kind of managing me, but not really. They were just being nice. Anyhow, a few days later, he calls them and I get a call from them. Um, Alan King called. He wants to put you in the Toyota Comedy Festival and blah, blah, blah. Make a long story short, we're there to do the thing. And I'm backstage and at one of the shows, not, not the one I did with you in Staten Island on the back of a hot dog truck, but... Oh, the only show my mother came to see, by the way. Anyway, continue. I'm at Lincoln Center. I'm backstage with Alan. And I said, Alan, I just want to thank you so much. Obviously, you've got the note, the tape, and, uh, you know, the whole thing. So he says, what note? I said, a note. I went to your house in Kings Point. I brought with a tape. He goes, I didn't get any tape note. I haven't been to Kings Point in three months. I've been staying in the city. Oh, I wow. said, well, I'm Herman Shane's grandson. He says, you're Herman Shane's grandson? He says, and you told me that because you wanted to get the comedy festival? I said, yes. He said, had I known, he says, you wouldn't be here. The son of a bitch owes me $11 from a card game in 1967. But I'm bummed. I know it was like one of those things. But also, Alan King gave me the best piece of advice that I ever got in my life because of Which friendship. Was? I was backstage with him at the Concord, and he was drinking gin, as he always did before he went on. And um, I was pouring the gin, he was drinking the gin. I was pouring it, he was drinking it. I said, you're drinking a lot. Cause you have to understand, I haven't had a drink since Christmas of 1990. So clean and sober has been my thing. I've never been on stage high or drunk. Alan's drinking gin, like, you know, he's going to the gulag. So I said, what are you doing? You're drinking, he says, well, I'm sick. I have cancer, I'm gonna die soon. He says, and so, you know, what's the difference? He says, I have to drink. Have you heard my act? So I said, oh, yes, wow. I've heard your act. He says, it's funnier for me. I said, well, I said, do you have any regrets? He said, I regret, hmm, I regret this. He says, um, I wasn't that good a husband. I wasn't a good father. I wasn't that good a son. I was so busy being Alan King. I didn't do those other things. He said, Sarjala, if you ever have the chance to put being a father, being a husband and being a good son first, don't worry about the Sarge part. God will take care of that. Just do your job. Wow. And it has shaped every decision I have made since regarding family, career. I have a life with a career in it. I don't have a career with a life somewhere out there. Um, I have a life with a career in it. It's not that important because if you're out there worried about something right now, I'm sure it isn't about gigs, health, family, there's so many things that come ahead of, you know. But sure. But that's really, that's a very uh, poignant and very, I mean, awesome piece of advice. Because I know when I first started, 
it was all about that. But then again, it's like I was, you know, afraid of vulnerability and it was easy for me to be more vulnerable with with uh, the audience and say uh, with myself, not even with my shrink, you know, um, but it 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 became you have a all- shrink. Do I have a shrink? I have a village. I got a team. I got a team of people. <laughs> you have a team. I, otherwise, team I wouldn't be flip here. Team the switch. Right. Flip the switch team. Yes, yes. By the way, I think I logged about 23 jokes. It was your joke telling ability. And what I love about your act so much, Sarge, is that you have taken your pain uh, talking about being biracial, being adopted, uh, talking about your uh, your addictions and your troubles. I mean, because clearly you had amazing schooling. Uh, you went to top-notch prep schools. You, I think you're brilliant. And the fact that I love this little piece about you that you, and by the way, if you've never seen Sarge, he will ask the audience song titles. He writes them down and he creates this uh, symphony uh, this amazing uh, medley, a medley, a medley. I was going to say compilation, you know. Well, I'm... let me let me let me stop you. Okay, um, please. One of the things, one of the things that's true for me, at some point, it stopped being an act, and that's the point at which I became a much better performer. And I don't say this, oh, I'm a much better performer than I used to be. My my act is not an act. Um, it's not uh, a hustle. It's not some character that I put on when I'm on stage. The miraculous thing was that my comedy and my performance is an outgrowth of who I've become as a person. And the premium coming from that Alan King bit of wisdom was to put your life first and let the other stuff flow from it. When I got clean and sober in 1990, and I was forced to start meditating for the sake of my overcoming addiction, Wow. It's then in the first meditation I ever did in my life, the first thing I thought of was me and my grandfather when I was six years old at Grossinger's watching Don Rickles. And the focus of the meditation, and this was during rehab, yeah. was what would you do with your life if you couldn't fail? What would you do? And I thought back to the time when I was six watching Rickles from under the cocktail table in the big showroom at Grossinger's Catskills Hotel. And I was thinking to myself, I don't know what that man is talking about. But look at these people. And I looked at the audience and there were 2000 people draped over each other, screaming with laughter, knocking over tables and drinks and enjoying it. And I said, I don't know what he's talking about, but I want to do that. And it was in the the first meditation that I did when turning my life around from homelessness, drug addiction to three narcotics. I was on PCP. I was on crack. I was on angel dust because I just can't decide. And you're a little so, bit of a compulsive drug user, if you ask me. Well, I just, you uh, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was, I, first of all, you know, alcohol was part of the deal, but sure. PCP, angel dust. I mean, I, I bought anything from that piss-stained tenement hallway in Spanish Harlem at 116th and Lenox in Manhattan. Um, I buy and then I'd use, and then I would disappear for a week. Um, ultimately, I lost my entire life behind that, except for one friend whose apartment that I robbed at 30th and Park. He had a duplex and I robbed his place and, uh, and I didn't and, you know, climb the balcony or break in. I asked him if I could use his apartment while he was in Aspen skiing for Christmas. And he said, oh sure, I'll leave the keys with the doorman. And so there I went, I was homeless. I had no place to go, I had no life. I had lost my job at a major sports television network at Black Rock on Sixth Avenue. I won't say the name of it. And um, hmm. so I used his apartment. And before he came home from Aspen, I had taken all of the things out of the drawers and out of his hiding places, his necklace, his, his, you know, everyone had a gold rope chain, uh, uh, a, a Gucci bracelet, cufflinks, a couple of Ebel and Van Cleef and Arpels watches. I took everything to 46th Street to the Orthodox where they have the jewelry uh, exchange. Right. And I got three, 300 bucks for all of this. $40,000 worth of jewelry, I got $300. You went, went to the wrong home. store, Sarge. I could have gotten 450 on 47th Street from right. my friend Yonko. <clears throat> so he came and found me somehow after he got back from Aspen because I wasn't there. But he found me. I was at Houston and Pitt down in lower Manhattan. I don't know how he found me. And he says, um, hey, you stayed at my place? I said, yeah. He goes, I'm missing a few things. You know where they are? I said, yeah, I, I sold them for drugs. I was about 360 pounds at the time. I was 360 while I was using, I was on the street. I'm the fattest, 
crack addict in New York at that time. So he says, well, what kind of drugs are you using? I said, well, I'm, I, I smoke crack predominantly. He goes, what kind of crack? I mean, he says, usually crack people are emaciated, anorexic. That's right. I said, I said it's, it's very high. It's not working for you. It's high calorie crack. <laughs> it's very, very rich. It's very high in carbohydrates. I was going to well, say we that. So I thought he was going to turn me into the police. He said, let's get you some help. And 24 Aww. hours later, 24. So listen, if you get out of the way, there are forces which come into play in your life, which Agreed. will carry you like a surfboard, like the waves under the surfboard, like whatever causes the waves to happen. So you know, and he that's, steps in and he helps you. And he and w was that your first go around in rehab? Is that when you? He discovered was my first. That was my that was my first angel. And, okay. I was, and, and ultimately, he put me in touch with a girlfriend of his that he was dating who was uh, on the suicide hotline. She knew an intervention counselor. I met with that guy and 24 hours later, I was on the steps of treatment um, in Delray Beach, Florida. I walked in, gentleman told me to pray for the obsession to be removed from my life, to drink and drug. And I did. And the next morning I woke up and I was no longer, it was almost like a spell was broken. Wow. I was no longer, I, and I had been using for 10 years. I mean, there's a whole history. Wow. It's in the book, Black Bite Chick. But at the end of the day, that was a new chapter because now I prayed once, three days later I meditated and I got the idea for being a comedian and I've never starved since. I've always, now listen, I've been on some of the biggest stages in the country. Right. I've been on the lowest stage. It, it doesn't matter. I live the life of an artist. I'm a performer. Um, I'm a love center. I'm somebody that brings joy to people. Um, you, know, it, uh, you know, it doesn't, I mean, I'm enriched, I'm inspired, and that's largely because I was saved and you can't convince me um, it wasn't supposed to go this way. Sure. Uh, what are they, I'm supposed to be here with you. Well, I'm glad, and you're supposed to be in my life because um, I just, the, the beginning, to, I always felt like Elaine and Seinfeld hanging out with you guys, and it was always like a confidence boost to be able to keep up with your, your jabs, and I mean, I felt like I could give it as, as good as you guys gave it to me. And it, it was the best, uh, I, I guess, entree into the stand-up world. And I just, you know, I'm so thrilled that we're friends, but moving on. So you have this awakening. Can now I just say that those, can I just say that those, we didn't, we were, we didn't realize how difficult what we were trying to do was when we sure. were friends. We had no, I mean, being friends and having a little bit of camaraderie in a very scary New York, where starting a comedy career in New York, at all the at all the open mic rooms in New York, right? And we traipsed around and we did it with each other, and the camaraderie of it didn't even allow us to realize just how eviscerating, how humiliating, how difficult, how embarrassing, how horrible, how steep the challenge was for us. Our friendship took the edge off of that. And it's Absolutely. only when I watched, I watched the comedy store, Binder's show on Showtime. Yeah. Um, they went through the same exact thing with Mitzi at the comedy store. And I only realized when watching that, I went through the same exact thing in New York, but with eight clubs. Right. <laughs> well, Gladys's Hamburger Harry's. Let's give a shout out to Gladys Simon because she really, uh, you know, she ran a great room. I mean, we all started with Gaffigan and Geraldo and remember Frank Gerisi? I don't know what happened to him. Yeah, yeah. But there was just a lot of people that came from our generation. And I mean, it was a whole different, you're right, it was fun. And the fact that we were, I always, people are like, what is it like doing stand up?" And I say, it's like bungee jumping without a change of underwear because I, but I also felt when we came up in comedy, it was so much easier. You didn't have to worry about being PC. You can really talk about things. In fact, uh, you know, the news has just been overwhelming. I was visiting my sister and brother-in-law and my husband, and we watched Eddie Murphy Delirious, and we were peeing ourselves. But my nephew, who's 18, and he's just coming into his, like, political awareness, and he's really emphatic Horrified. about- Horrified. The, and we Horrified. were laughing and he was like, I can't believe you're laughing at it. But then he started laughing at this because he knows that not that I mean, I, I like pushing the envelope. I've always done that. But I am respectful of other people's beliefs at times. Um, but look, Marla, Marla, I'll give you an example just in my lifetime. OK, today I'm a person of color. OK, 
Now I got buddies watching out there today. They're in uh, they're in South Carolina at the Comedy Cabana doing one of the first live gigs in front of uh, pandemic. Rick Corso's over there. Troy Thirdgill's over there. They're watching today. They're at the Comedy Cabana in Myrtle Myrtle Beach. Troy's black. Rick is white. I was born mixed. But when I was born, I was considered Negro. This is just political correctness and how much you can't say. So sure. when I was born, I was I was considered a Negro baby. Then I was considered a colored baby. They changed. Oh, Negro is very offensive. Colored. Then they went from colored. Then I was mulatto. This is all in the span of my infancy. Now I'm a mulatto baby. Long before Starbucks, I was a grande frappuccino mulatto. I was, I was just going to say, baby. if you were in New Orleans, you would have been Cafe Olay. That's right. So mulatto, then I was a mulatto, then I was Afro-American, they changed to that. Then we were browns, then we were black, then we were brown again, then we were African-American. Then they realized some people are from Louisville, Kentucky, so they're not from <laughs> Africa. So now they're people uh, of origin. Uh, then it was mixed race, then race wasn't good to say, so then it was multi-ethnic. Okay, now, land color. the plane, this, I got it. This is, no, but this is where we've landed, sure. person of color. So are you, uh, and that's how you describe yourself you now, person. Crazy. Yeah. I know. No, no, but you got to worry about pronouns. Uh, the guy's got a wig. He think he identifies as a woman, but he's got balls. It's a shim. I, 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 but the thing is. I'm teasing what? everybody. I don't mean to offend. I know it's really. The sensitivity. Really yes. The, yes. The sensitivity angle is. Well, I have to use the right pronoun so I'm not inconsiderate to her insanity. <laughs> Don't you find that there's certain, like, you know, the middle age, you know, 40s and up, where personally, I mean, I want to give out, uh, give, give a shout out to Governors. It's one of my favorite clubs, and it's Governors Comedy Radio, the Govs Radio Network that is hosting this. So I want to say thank you. But thank there's. You governors. Governors is, I just feel like you can, it's, it's old school, you know, it, it, uh, you can just let it rip and you really don't have to worry if somebody's going to get their knickers in a twist or like tighten their sphincter. It's like one of the last places where you can just be, and just let it rip. Um, Cause I know, I mean, before the pandemic performing in the city, if you had like, if I said something, uh, you know, you could just feel the sphincters puckering. And it's usually the younger generation, like millennials and below. And listen, I don't want to offend, but you know, you watch The Godfather. What are they gonna say? You can't watch The Godfather anymore? You know, they call people Jews and guineas and wops and everything. And it was just the sign of the times. Do you know what I mean? What? Disney recently came out disavowed the plot lines of their legendary movies for being racially and sometimes gender-based insensitive. Right. But they're not going to be redacting any of those movies or changing them because it's a good uh, measuring stick for people to be able to see what was okay in these different times. I mean, Amos and Andy was a black and white comedy sure. that was on the radio and then television. The jokes they did, the sidekick to Jack Benny. With each successive... I mean, Lu Lucy and Ricky, you know, he was a caricature of a, of, a, of a Cubano. They made more Cuban jokes on that show. So listen. And they would imitate his accent, sure. I mean, it's, but the thing is, I think the, uh, you know, it, it's almost like, how do you describe a diner owner? They're typically Greek or, you know, a lot of the tailors are Asian. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, you have yeah, to get very- Yeah, but Marla, clear. Marla, Marla, you're forgetting Sarge. something. We, we grew up in New York. Yes. We grew up in New York and, and it's a very sheltered life because even though you encounter many different nationalities of people, those nationalities of people had indigenous job positions. So sure. for instance, it was a Pakistani newsstand guy, but it was a Punjabi taxi cab driver, a Jamaican pot dealer, a Dominican Coke dealer. Yes. Do you know, like, you know, I, I was 28 years old before I met any one Chinese and had a conversation with them that wasn't taking my order. Like, I, I lived in New York. I saw Chinese people all the time, but I didn't know any. Right. I knew them in their job. And there were jobs for different nationalities, which is a very sheltered. When I got to college at Boston University, I'd grown up in Great Neck. So I'm not one of these kids that grew up on the poor side of town. Everybody I knew growing up, their family owned something. Right. They owned something. My father is the guy behind Levi's. My, God, my father runs Calvin Klein. 
my father does this, my father does that. When I got to BU, Boston University, I met a girl from Brooklyn and I said, hi, Maddie. And um, we were talking. I said, what does your dad do? She goes, he drives a bread truck for Fink Breads. I Never said, heard of Fink Breads. It was always Entenmann's. Hey, listen, I want to talk I, I about- said, wait, let me, make, let me just say this. I said- Land the plane. Your, da your, your, your dad drives a bread truck? Whose dad drives a bread truck? Like, I, I couldn't understand how she had a dad that had an actual job. He didn't own anything. Right. Um, so New York has its own shelter. That's what I'm, the point I'm making ethnically. So Und well, take it for what it's that worth. Was, no, I, I take it. And that was, that was a good point. But listen, Sarge, how do you, okay. It, the, it seems like the world is imploding. Every, there's such divisiveness. People uh, are no longer friends because one person will vote for Trump and the other one is thinking of voting for Biden. And you just turn on the news and everything is so bleak. Um, uh, I know I went into a depression, you know, when COVID hit, it was the come, come, uh, it was like the tail end of just two years dealing with, you know, aging sick parents. And I'm, you know, again, I'm sorry that your dad passed um, since we were, you know, anyway, I know what that's like. So that's what I'm trying to say. However, it's, uh, it took a, like, it took a couple of months to try and get back to a routine and, and appreciate the finer things. Or uh, uh, I just, it was really important to find things and to reconnect with things that made me happy. Like being outside. Uh, I love being on the water, hiking. Uh, it was those little things that helped me get back to or breaking my depression. And then also laughing was really key. Now, what has been your experience and what do you do to just, you know, reconnect and not let the world, you know, rain on your parade, so to speak? I, um, you know, it's funny, the life that I live, I, I live in Florida. I have of an course. incredible life. The world fell apart March 12th. I was doing a show on March 12th, March 13th. Show's no longer good. I had an entire March booked. I had an entire April booked. I had an entire May booked. I had seven gigs in June Same. that were fairly lucrative. Yep. So, uh, July, I had the whole thing right through the New Year's. I, right. make, I have a New Year's Eve gig that sold out eight shows, and I've got a Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, two shows on each one for the Jews so who have busy. nothing to do. You, were, you had a um, full no, calendar. No. Booked solid. Got it. However, it wasn't just me going through this. It was everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm used to bleak beginnings because I restarted my life at 29 years old and had to start from the brass tacks. Sure. So I know, I know how to start from scratch. And after a couple of weeks of licking my wounds and crying in my soup and all the other cliches that go with it, I know how to sit back for a second and allow the universe to do its thing. Okay. So what would you, know, you I, let me put a pin in that. So, let, let, let me make the point. Okay. So I, I couldn't imagine life of me because fear was a big part of it. Fear. Oh, yeah. Me. I don't know when this is going to be over. I don't know when this is going to let up. I don't know when I'm all these gigs are not canceling. They're rescheduling. And there's fear. Fear is a great teacher because whenever you're scared, it's a sure sign that you're relying on the wrong strength. And so what I did was I started to do more meditation. I started to do more of my, I know this sounds crazy, but it was my spiritual stuff that saved me because ultimately my manager called me and said, you know, you can do shows online. You can do like virtual shows in front. And I said, are you kidding me? I will never do that. And I hung up but I realized my fear was in the way. Yeah. And I, I called him back about a week later. That's how long it took me. I prayed about it. I meditated about it, getting rid of the fear. And I finally said, you know what? Let's do this. Rented a soundstage, four camera shoot, no people. I put a cue card on the floor for myself with a set list. I said, let's go. Let me try it. And, you know, after about 10 minutes, I got to minute 11. And I said, you know, this isn't so bad. But were you getting it, feedback? Were you getting feedback from the audience? Were people, or were you no, just performing? There was okay. no, there was no audience. I was on a soundstage. But here's the thing: it really summonses up the confidence and the courage. Sure. Anybody can perform with a full house of people laughing. Do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in your humor? Do you believe in your character? Do you believe yes. in what you're doing? 
I've heard the laughter enough to know where the laughs are supposed to be. Because when I'm on stage in front of a full audience and they're not there, I automatically assume it's their fault. Good for you. Here I am in an empty room. Have you performed in front of any, uh, cause I just, uh, I started doing a couple of Zoom shows. I've also done uh, some speaking, which is another area that I'm moving into, you know, because I am a mental health advocate. But I, my, this summer I had to do t uh, two hours, uh, not, you know, two different shows, one hour. The first show was up on a hill uh, under a tent and down the hill were tiki torches surrounded by socially distanced chairs and up in the Berkshires around when the sun starts going down, that's when the bugs come out. So I'm wearing a sleeveless shirt. I'm performing in front of like, you know, 30 people all with masks on. I can't really hear anything, but just piggybacking on what you said, I was like, I know this stuff works and I kept on plowing through, but it's so disconcerting to be performing in front of people uh, with masks on, because even if they're laughing, it's like, <laughs> you, it's hard to read the audience. And again, you just have to rely on, you know, your skills. But then the is next it more night- what? Is it more disconcerting? Is it more disconcerting than deciding that you're going to do this for a living? Is it more disconcerting that, that almost getting the part on the TV show or almost getting booked for a gig that you would have liked to have gotten? No more. I, you know, disconcerting, I can live with. Um, distraction, I can live with. That, it yep. requires another part of my soul and my brain to be active. Yeah. And, and so consequently, fear. When I remove fear and I approach a project fearlessly, meaning yep. I stand on top of the hill in front of the tiki torches under the tent with 30 people listening from 100 yards away with masks, I don't let it get in the way of yep. me That's just doing advice. my group. No fear. That's I have to advice. pray about it, meditate about it, channel it, and hit it. And you know what? I called my manager back and I said, you know what, I can do this. And since then I've done about 21 gigs with no people. And here's the main nuance. Let's hear it's it. Easier, it's easier to work on an empty soundstage than it is to work in a theater or a club with chairs. Empty seats are much worse than an empty soundstage. And I'll tell you why for me. When it's an empty soundstage, I've accepted the fact that I'm working in an empty room. When it's a theater and there's no people there, even though you know why the seats are empty, your brain keeps running this. Yes. Nobody came. Nobody came. Oh, it's there's terrible. No, the inner voices. Draw. You're not a draw. Nobody likes you. Who thought you? No, who thought you could make a career out of this? I mean, uh, you know, the voice is awful. So with that said, uh, Listen, performing, in, I, the next night I had to perform in front of plexiglass and I felt like I was an extra in The Handmaid's Tale because again, you just see everybody with the masks on. But again, I got into gratitude. I said, wow, at least I'm in front of an audience. At least I'm still having a live experience and an interchange because at this point I could hear the muffled laughter through the, uh, you know, through the plexiglass. But you should have worn a hockey helmet. You know what? I have a couple of shows career. coming up. Yeah, I have a couple of shows coming up. So basically, I think the overarching message is... I have a don't... couple of shows coming up. I'll try that. A mouthpiece and a hockey helmet. I'll try that. That's a great idea, Sarge. Thanks. You're always with the great ideas. So basically, I think the overarching theme is don't be fearful. Let it motivate you. Meditate. Uh, don't do drugs. Now, uh, you mentioned meditation. Do you have, a, you know, do you listen to guided meditations? Do you? Well, let me backtrack. Let me backtrack. It's impossible to not be fearful. So what the, let me, let me make a point to that. Fear it is a short it, point because we're, we're it, coming up on it's time. In, it's inevitable that fear comes up in oh, all yeah. situations. So don't be fearful is kind of like not as effective as or how about notice, work it? Notice it. Notice, notice okay. that you're fearful. Okay. And then ha I have a protocol to eradicate fear, and that is to connect with the universe. When I put my confidence that the universe Beautiful. is in perfect order, the, co the confidence is given to me. When I try to summons up confidence without acknowledging my place in the universe, I have no shot. I'm just going to be scared. And I had to do this because I can't have a couple of shots of bourbon or a couple of hits off a joint in order to take the fear away or the yep. stage fright away. So I had to develop a protocol. And all I'm saying is 
don't just say don't be fearful. Say find a protocol for eradicating fear from your life that's spiritual, that helps you to get rid of it so that you can be more creative and be more who you really are. Because when fear shows up, it brings up the worst uh, personality traits. And when oh, yeah. fear is not present, you get to be you. You get to show up as who you're supposed to be. Um, I th first of all, thank you so much for correcting me on my show. I appreciate that. Um, my I goal always, is to never always... be invited back. No, no, no. I can always count on you. But I just, I want to uh, say how helpful you were to me. You know, when, do you remember last year this time I was on a 14 day cruise. I was sailing around every island, Caribbean island. And it was so stressful being on the ship. I mean, because the minute the boat pulled away, I started thinking about the ship, that uh, Carnival cruise that was stranded five days off of Galveston and shit was like pouring through. There was like no water, no and crap was like coming through the... So that's where I go because I'm just so OCD. And I called you up and I was having panic attacks because you just feel so judged. And I've spoken to other female comedians about this, that you know, women are judged differently on the cruise ships and you're dealing with so many people that really haven't experienced stand up. Um, but I, you really talked me off the ledge and it was so important. And I think what is so great when you have a spiritual program, you know who you can call and just be like, okay, here's the situation. And the fact that you just boom, keyed into it and talk me off the ledge. And you've talked me off the ledge on several other situations, but I, uh, that's the I was beauty. Point that out. Huh? I was going to bring that up. You I was going to bring that up. It's been, it's been, I'm going to talk to the people now. It's been, it's been a lot of times. No, it more hasn't. Num You're more fine. numerous than I see the freckles. Do you see the freckles? More than I have freckles. I've talked to her on She nah, should nah, basically nah, just nah, get nah. rid of her house and just live on a ledge. She should have a whole house of ledges. <laughs> Four, five, come on, I'm waiting for like, you're just rolling and rolling, rolling the jokes. Okay, so uh, I just wanna say, what really makes you laugh? What makes you laugh? Well, make, well, making fun of my friends. And you know, that's a funny thing because I didn't used to be somebody, I was always able to make fun of people but wasn't able to take a joke myself. Oh yeah, no, you had a thin skin. Until I finally learned that when people joke with you, it's love that you're not accepting. It's love that you're not receiving. Yeah. I was always able to give out uh, the, the, the punishment, but I wasn't oh, able to you take were, it. You were, you were tough. You were tough. I was very sensitive. I was very sensitive and I didn't, I had, I, I was very thin skinned, but today I'm still a sensitive person, but um, I'm able to take it as well as give it. But I think, I think, you know, very wealthy, successful people can hire very high priced help. I think out of necessity, we've had to manage ourselves and find a oh, way yeah. ourselves. I don't know how many books, how many podcasts, how many, how many. So for me, I live by a really golden rule. Um, and that is um, to take care of the total self. And whatever comes out of me is going to be useful, productive and positive for the world. I take care of the total self. Yes, and, and also means... taking responsibility and keeping, you know, uh, I don't, I'm borrowing some, uh, you know, uh, keep, what, keeping your side of the street. And I think that's- Keeping my side of the street clean. Clean, yeah. Is that what Telling I said? Telling the truth. Well, you can't tell the truth if you don't know what the truth is. If you're delusional, right. you don't know what the truth is. So, you know, by letting other people tell you what the truth is, you start to get a consensus between you and them about what the actual truth is. The truth is, before I wake up, before I look at my phone, before I talk to the dog, before I see what the weather is out the window, I engage in a three-part protocol of meditation, affirmation, and prayer. It's very quick. Yeah. I do grateful, 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 gratitude, 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 gratitude. I do a prayer. Where do you want me to go today? What do you want me to do? What should I say and to whom? And the positive affirmation is gratitude. Bravo. Gratitude is, it makes me more fluid it helps me to be more grounded. It reminds me of who I'm supposed to be, not who I'm trying to be. And then within the context of comedy, it allows me to show up with a exponential lower level of fear than I otherwise would if I was constantly beholden to other people to like me or love me or laugh at me because I need that because I'm so starving. 
you know, yeah. and the truth of the matter is I'm there to give, I'm not there to get. And right. that's the key. But Sarge, it took you, you know, they always say to become a real true stand up, it takes about 10 years and they call it, you know, getting, you know, uh, peeling the layers of the onions. I remember Joy Behar said that to me because I, you see a lot of comedians and they want, 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 but it's the ones that really do the work, be it going to 12 step programs, therapy, podcasts. But when you really peel away the layers, you know. Are they categorically, are they categorically linked? Podcasts? Uh, I don't know. You mentioned podcasts. I, who knows? I mean, but there's so no, many No, no, but you, you, you mentioned them in the, in the same breath as therapy. Whatever. Podcasts, Strike that from shrink, the record. Strike that from. No it's, no, it's funny. It's funny. I'm just saying it's funny the way you, you said it so naturally. Um, yeah, shrinks, 12-step programs, glazed donuts. Glazed um, donuts. That was my thing. No, I, 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 it was like, I was, it, it definitely took, my dog is biting my finger. Come here, Teddy. You want attention? And of course, oh, I'm live. This is so cliche. Shut up, Sarge. She's playing with a dog. No, Where I can't help it. It's right. <laughs> Ow. Soft bite. I have to, so, I have to go. The baby no, is crying. No, hang on a second. I just want to, listen. So basically, baby. the con, you know, the conversation that I've had with young comedians is be patient, work on yourself. And it's so funny. You mentioned something about, you know, you didn't need it. But initially, comics go into this profession because we're maybe we didn't get something at home growing up, but we need that from the audience. But if you match that with doing work on yourself, I think it is comedy stand up, at least for me, has provided a lifeline into having the life that I have now. You know, I think I think, well, one of the things that's different for me personally is that I didn't start doing comedy until I'd already slayed some of my demons. In other words, I didn't get sober in the midst of a scandal in my comedy career. Right. I had all my scandals. I got clean and sober. I was given tools with which to improve myself. And as an outgrowth of all of that work that I'd begun to do, I decided that the next thing that I wanted to do with the rest of my life was be a humor person, someone that brings joy to people. There you so go. That, that's key right there. It's like, and so, Comedy is an outgrowth of my recovery, not the other way around. And um, Ditto. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I feel that way too because, you know, I, I just got an email from somebody and I also have done programs using humor. You know, uh, humor is your lifeline. And she wrote to me and just, I, I had these three simple exercises and she's like a very successful uh, marketing person. And it said it was a real game changer for her because she was told that she wasn't funny. And uh, I gave a bunch of people very impromptu uh, exercises and she got up and she nailed it and she was hilarious. And she said, just that feeling, you know, that in your body of making somebody laugh is just so powerful. And, you know, going back to gratitude, I'm really grateful that I can use this, my humor. I, I look at upon it as a gift to connect with other people because you make somebody laugh it just flips the switch, baby. And Whoa. with that, do you like how I, I tied it all got, up? That I was a callback, we, people. We got to wrap it up. We, we got to wrap it, it up. up. The switch. The Flip switch. the switch. There we go. So you guys, every Tuesday, four o'clock, I'm going to have amazing guests from, you know, all walks of life who really have uh, triumphed over tragedy and had some part of it, uh, due in part to having humor and laughing. Boy, that was a mouthful. Sarge, love you, baby. Yeah. Thank you. No, Thank anytime you. Anytime I can see a beautiful woman with a mouthful, it's fantastic. Oh, I was waiting for a dick joke. On that, ladies and gentlemen, please, you know, we're going to re uh, we're going to repurpose this. It's going to be rebroadcast on Governor's, my face page, Sarge's face page, YouTube channels. Uh, sorry for the technical hiccups, but we did it. Right, Sarge? You hung oh, in there boy. with me. Oh, boy. But please tune in next Tuesday. And uh, I noticed that there's a lot of comments, so I couldn't really get to the questions. But uh, feel free to private message me. Sarge, where are you going to be next? What I'm Zoom going to, channel? Well, actually, tomorrow night, um, tomorrow night I'm doing a gig for a uh, – yeah, the corporates are the best. I'm doing yeah. a corporate gig tomorrow night. 
um, at 7.30. Uh, I can't tell people where to go. Just go to IamSarge.com. There you go. Or go to my Comedian Sarge Facebook page or Sarge and in Charge on um, Instagram. Um, or you can just call me, 561-901-5199, and I'll answer the phone. And I'm very happy to, and I won't screen it. Beautiful. I'll talk to you. Sarge. Call me if I can help you. Call me if I can help you. Call me if I can brighten your day. Call me if uh, I owe you money. Call me. Call me. I like I'm so that. glad you called me. I love you see that. See how I wrapped it up? See how I wrapped it up? So <laughs> I'm glad you called me. Um, it was an honor to be here today. Thank you. And, and I'll come back anytime um, anyone drops out. Okay. I appreciate that. You're, you're, listen, you know, I can talk to you forever, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are back next week, four o'clock. Tell your friends. And I thank you so much for listening. Sarge, stay healthy. Love you. Love, love you, you too. Bye. Love you. Love you.